Okay. Now that we are all here, we can start with our second panel discussion on this conference, Times of Resistance. Uh, this panel is uh, called Protesting and Contesting, and it occurred to me, uh, after I saw the translation that in Serbian, contesting is translated as, in a way, comp competing, which was never really my first association, but it does open uh, one way to, to observe this. Uh, current protests, which come from variety of contexts and reasons and <clears throat> struggles, do compete with another uh, co counter movement of the right and populist uh, processes. So, uh, yeah, in both meaning protesting and contesting, we will talk today with Clementina uh, Sushanov, right? Suha. Suhanov, sorry is one of the organizers of the strike of Polish women from October last year, known as Black Protest, which stopped the government from introducing a penalization of women for abortion, main coordinator of the International Women's Strike on the 8th of March, 2017, author of several non-fiction books. Uh, also, we have with us our old friend, uh, who was many times in CZKD, Dr. Damir Arsenijevic, the founding member of the platform, uh, the Workers' University Tuzla, as one of the outcomes of the February 2014 protests, and is an associate professor in critical theory and literature at the University of Tuzla. He develops and carries out collaborative interventions intersecting in academia, activism, and arts in Bosnia and Herzegovina. He tackles, uh, through such interventions, the following areas. How to dismantle governance through poverty, how to build emancipatory ways of dealing with the trauma and remembrance of the war and genocide, and how to sustain solidarity networks by fiercely defending the commons. Also, uh, from uh, Poland, uh, we have our third guest from Fo Poland at this conference, Mateusz Kijowski. Or... Kijowski. Okay, is an IT specialist, journalist, social activist, and blogger. Uh, his interests and major activities have been focused on human rights and open society values. He initiated a nationwide discussion about rape culture in Poland. He supported actions helping refugees and asylum seekers. He campaigned for shared custody and protection of children with their parents fight uh, their divorce battles. He was also involved in actions against anti-vaccine movement and quackery. At the onset of the Polish constitutional crisis in the 19th of November 2015, he started the Committee for the Defense of Democracy, COD, which was referred to today in the previous panel, as a Facebook group, and within three days, the group gathered over 30,000 members to organize peaceful protests in defense of democracy and civil rights in Poland. Uh, also with us, we have our uh, colleague, Ljubica Slavkovic, uh, colleague meaning that she is also our colleague in CZKD, part of our team. Uh, she's a Belgrade-based architect and researcher, graduated at the University of Belgrade. She's practicing architect, uh, and awarded architectural critic and an editor of Chief of Commons in the Architectural Magazine and Research Platform. She's an active in producing lectures, workshops, and seminars, and researching the architecture and the city as a spatial cultural phenomena. She's a project leader and editor at the CZKD and member of Citizen Initiative, Don't Run Belgrade, Ne Davimo Beograd. Uh, with us from Bucharest, Andrea Petrut works in the field of public policies for higher education at the Romanian, uh, Romanian Academic Society, one of the oldest think tanks from Romania. Her academic background is in political science and political organization management. She was one of the leaders of the student movement from Romania and was an organizer in most civic protests of the past few years. She's, uh, she's active in several NGOs and civic groups that promote integrity, equality of opportunity, participative democracy, and protection of the environment. And our colleague uh, from Belgrade, uh, also known from before in Czezkada, uh, Matija Medenica, sociologist and political activist from Belgrade. Uh, he's a founding member of the revolutionary socialist organization Marx 21. Between 2008 and 2013, he acted as an executive editor of a socialist magazine Solidarnost. 
During his studies, he was in the forefront of numerous progressive student movements and initiatives, primarily around the issues of tuition fees and the rise of fascist right. His Serbo Croatian translation of the first critical study of Syriza's uh, government in Greece, Syriza Inside the Labyrinth, was published in 2016, uh, in Pluto Press 2015. So uh, that was the presentation. Floran, uh, maybe you should yeah. start with the first run. So uh, in the, the first round table was more um, analytical for us to develop some context, to com some context and to, to, to cross ideas. In the second round table, we aim to give, <coughs> sorry, to give space to people directly involved in the movements to tell us more about the, the, the movements themselves. I would propose that maybe we discuss first about Poland, where we have two speakers, then uh, Romania, uh, then uh, Bosnia, and then we finish with Serbia in, in this order. Uh, and basically, uh, it's what I think is interesting for us is um, what did, you do, what did you do, how did you achieve it, these kind of mobilizations that we have seen uh, quickly in the videos, uh, where do you stand now, maybe more sharing about us uh, some of your successes, because success stories from movements, it's always something good to hear and some experience that you can always take something from it, and uh, maybe some of the, um, uh, the the, the strategic decisions, the turning points that you already faced or that you see coming so that we can understand a bit more the, not just the one demonstration with this so many people, but the, the process of how did you build this uh, mobilization of the citizens and in, to the limit of, uh, within the limits of what is possible, where do you think it's going to go? I know it's always very difficult, but really concentrating on the, the practical experience and achievements and maybe lessons learned through that. Uh, I don't know if uh, maybe uh, Clementina, you want to yeah. start? Hello, everybody. I am quite a peculiar case because uh, what we did in Poland as women was a strike, was not a protest, yeah? Uh, so we, as uh, women, we adapted the idea of workers' strike uh, for a gender-based issue. So that's the very big difference probably in this audience. And um, we, of course, uh, took it from uh, the um, strike uh, from Iceland, from women who made the strike in 1975. Uh, this idea was circulating already in Poland of a strike as a response to our government actions uh, because there were already many threats on the way since they won elections. Uh, but uh, last October, actually by the end of September, they started uh, voting, discussing and processing a law that was um, forbidding total ban on abortion. Um, and it was even introducing punishment on women for including miscarriages. So it was a complete, um, mm, f very much physical threat. Because when we have, for example, a Mateusz's movement, uh, which is for democracy, it's for an idea. In this case, it, we felt, I personally felt definitely this way, I, I felt physically threatened by our government. It was like somebody was really attacking me, uh, my body, uh, touching me and doing things inside of me that I don't want. And I don't want those things to happen to my daughter, I don't want this thing to happen to, to my friends. Um, the atmosphere, uh, I mean, let's start this way. The strike was organized in one week. This is very important information for people who would like to consider such a thing. Uh, but you need a very strong incentive, as we had with this uh, idea of the new law. Um, many people were saying it's impossible, because strike is a serious thing, you need to prepare, you need to st uh, start talking with the unions, you need to make agreements and preparations. Uh, but we knew that in our capitalistic world, um, getting in uh, agreement with uh, the workers' unions is impossible. Basically, uh, the big union that we have, which is called, ironically, Solidarity, is standing by the government side. So um, we didn't expect much, nothing 
from them. So we knew since the beginning that it has to happen on, uh, on new terms. And we invented the terms. Uh, it was a kind of open form of strike. So those of us who could really strike abandoned work did it in many times agreement with their um, bosses. So it also showed the consciousness of, the, um, of this class of people, upper class of people usually, um, um, co social consciousness and gender consciousness. And in many cases, even in private business, which was the main concern, um, uh, the private business reacted uh, quite positively. I don't say that it was a massive scale, but it was a surprise to see they are supportive. Um, uh, in other cases, uh, let's say you had an option to take two hours off for your, from your work to go to street and take part in, uh, in protests or because there were, it was called strike, but the strike, the, um, uh, it was calling people to go out, of course, and to show on the streets. Uh, so there were different forms during the day to occupy people with something. So if somebody could stay with us from the very morning at 8 o'clock, for example, in Warsaw, we had um, blockages of roads. And um, uh, there was one uh, thing at around 10, 11 o'clock by the um, office of the uh, ruling party. There, it was called something like a fury, wall of furies. Uh, so um, women came really to scream, shout, and show the fury we feel. And then at the, by the evening, there was the massive gathering that you know from pictures and da da da. So, but it had different forms during the day. Um, and you could participate on any stage of that. So if you were not able to leave your work at six o'clock in the evening, you had this massive gathering for everybody to come in one place to meet, be together, and to uh, end the day of the strike. Uh, also, there was included um, domestic uh, form of strike. So you abandon your domestic work as woman to show that how much is done by us. Uh, so it had this economic um, effect in our working places, uh, in our companies, but also in our uh, private life to mark as a special division line showing uh, the contribution of women to the general you know, state economy plus uh, personal life. Uh, that was a very um, interesting experience and as people started exchanging uh, their um, stories, it turned out to be a very uh, educative uh, <laughs> act for their families. Um, and there was also discussed an idea of, a se of sexual strike, which we didn't do. But it was discussed, <clears throat> it was considered, and was uh, rejected by the majority, uh, saying that this is uh, too humiliating for women to, to do it this way. That this way we like somehow treat ourselves as just flash, yeah, sexual um, device. Um, so it was a strike. Um, Right now, we have nine months, so we are nine, nine, nine months old. Uh, it's a quite a significant, significant time. And um, from, as Michal pointed out, from this very open um, idea of our protest, which was very inclusive, I mean, uh, it was inclusive even for people who are Catholic uh, you know, believers. Um, so we were very different uh, persons inside, uh, agreeing only on one point, that we don't like to be punished, you know, by uh, natural happenings like miscarriage, for example. Um, so that was the main agreement between us. However, uh, there were different uh, political also um, personal ideas of the people participating. But since that time, as the polls show, and investigations and our conversations also, is that um, um, even two, three months later, um, the agreement for free abortion, even among those ladies who felt at the beginning that uh, they accept the so-called compromise, uh, they are changing their idea and saying, no, this is wrong, because um, uh, we should have a right, and, or no, put it another way, um, 
why the government has to indicate us what's wrong and what's bad. It would be better if we do it ourselves in our own consciousness, in our private life, because there are different cases, there are different situations, there are different conditions, social conditions, and human and personal and, and so forth. So um, they started taking, it was not set, put this way that whether abortion is good or it's, it's bad, but if somebody needs to make a decision why government has to be that part, yeah? Um, so, um, uh, there is a real switch of um, more people being uh, on the side for abortion right now among women and uh, especially in our movement in this moment we don't have those discussions whether abortion is good or not. Or not. It was a very quick process. Um, and, now, and now, nine months later, that's why I'm speaking of nine, um, and uh, today is Friday. Tomorrow there is a kind of political um, act of our uh, government. Uh, the story of it is too complicated, so I'm not going to explain it, but it's used, uh, it's made each month, and it's since a long time, it's used as a political weapon, however, it's presented as a religious event. Um, last month, uh, it's always on the 10th of each month, it's, ab it's about the um, crash of a plane with our uh, government people, president, couple, and so forth. It has to do with that. Uh, so, last month, um, I mean, uh, the ladies from the strike, uh, on a free basis, they participate in any other movements they want. There is n nothing like agreed between us that we should be leftists or we should be rightists or whatever. However, the inclination, the growing inclination is to the left. Uh, but, um, we really radically uh, start being politicized. And uh, last month, two of us uh, took part in this monthly gathering in the evening uh, by the presidential palace. And they showed the flag of our strike. And immediately they were attacked by the crowd, the supporters of the government. Um, one of them was quite injured and there was some treatment that she's under right now. Uh, so we felt like we were attacked as the movement. And uh, in response, tomorrow we, we are making our strong appearance because there are many of us coming from across Poland to be there at that moment and to show off and to... And it, by this act, uh, to show how we are radicalizing into poli pol politics accusation somehow, I don't know how to say, I mean, how to explain. I mean, from uh, regular women in October last year, um, which had nothing to do with politics, today we are becoming more and more radical, not because we want it, but because we are pressed and because we are attacked. And uh, the only response we can, we, we can give is to really start participating in it. There was a talk about violence, and I was um, thinking to add this point. Uh, it's not only about the violence that um, the, usually the government side uses by the forces they have, police, arms, military people, and that. Uh, it's not uh, also only about the movements, the counter movements to the government actions, um, whether they respond with violence or not. In Poland, the tendency is uh, peaceful um, manifestation, peaceful confrontation. In general, yeah, this is the, the way. Um, but what's very significant about those regular women who are uh, today probably packing to go and start tomorrow uh, is uh, that they are not scared anymore of a confrontation with the violence. They are really uh, not people even like us because I can say about myself, yes, I'm living in a big city, I have my education, I am blah, blah. But there are others who are not. Uh, they are unemployed single mothers of uh, three kids, for example, and uh, you know they are in big shit, <laughs> generally speaking. Uh, they are having very harsh life, and um, they are decided. They decided to do it, to, to do this, uh, uh, and show because there's lots of medias, there's the coverage, there's a kind of um, even. Uh, chasing after capturing our faces to show on the public TV that's owned totally today by the government 
and intermediates. And then uh, we know that uh, there will be some uh, detentions, there will be some investigations later on, and they really agree for it. And what's also um, interesting here is that it's usually ladies uh, coming from the province who are much more ready and decided to, to act and to um, um, more courageous in general than uh, the ladies from big cities. For example, in Warsaw, there was a big resistance to appear on a zone that would be, um, because of the new law about the ga public gatherings, it would be considered as legal. And uh, most of the Warsaw ladies are, are not willing to take part in this part of the happening tomorrow. Uh, they would stay on the legal side where the gatherings are registered. Uh, but the ladies coming from Poland, they simply say, we fuck it, we go there because we come to see the real thing and you know, they don't see other option. So once they are in Warsaw, they really like to be in the center of the thing, even if it's illegal today. So this is, that shows the determination. So what's going to happen next? Um, I don't know, but definitely, uh, and there was an uh, experiment run in one of the cities in Poland um, uh, for uh, women to run uh, in elections in the future. It was done in Wrocław um, on a small scale uh, at the city council level. Um, uh, local, local councils of, of quarters, different quarters of the city. And um, uh, it was a great achievement because uh, they increased radically the number of women participating in the local authorities. And this is a way to prepare for you know, other elections, or to school boards, to different boards that you can have. And in the future also with this um, idea of taking part in um, parliamentary uh, elections or uh, presidential elections, maybe, who knows. Um, we are not defining in our, within our movement whether we should go to join this party or that party. Um, um, the general rule of our movement is that uh, nothing is, is centralized. Uh, we tend to have no leaders, no one face for the movement. Uh, however, locally you have the local organizers in charge, and but sometimes it's this person, but then it's too occupied, and there's another person taking taking care of it. So it's flexible, but um, and also uh, there are some people who feel better with uh, to deal with medias, and some who are not. So we switch between each other, but. Um, uh, we don't define it. We say, you locally, you know the best uh, what's good for you. So, uh, in general, the movement is no logo, but if in your place, if you have a party, somebody who is a member of a certain party, and it's a good person, and the person helps you, and the person is really trustful and so forth, then uh, why not? Do you we know work together and if they need to show their flag, show the flag. It's up to you. But on the national level, we say that we don't accept parties because we don't like to be um, taken over simply yeah, and used in the future. So this is our resistance. We as women don't like to be used for any political um, party. <coughs> and, and one more um, thing to add, because it's a gender-based movement, uh, it's human, it's universal, and so forth, it's uh, international. This is why we started immediately after the um, strike on the 3rd of October. Um, the inspiration went to Argentina, and on 21st they organized the, their strike by New Una Menos, a big movement in Latin America. And um, soon after that, I mean, the, around that date of uh, the Argentina strike, we were already in touch and planning for a general strike of women on uh, international level. And uh, we chose the date for the 8th of March because this is the day of. And um, the, the, the international also collaboration and determination is so strong that, uh, you know, soon after the 8th, the, day, uh, the next day, uh, some of us started already preparing for the next year to organize, but also a strike, not a protest anymore, not the march anymore. But we really aim at uh, stopping the production and showing what it means to deal with, you know, uh, more than half of the population. They completely underestimate the numbers, our um, 
uh, contribution to the economy, our contribution to the education, our, our contribution to simple life. And that's the way we, we decided to, to do it. Thank you, Clementina. Uh, uh, maybe I forgot to, to say, uh, you said success. Uh, the immediate success after the Polish strike in October was that the government stepped out from this idea. However, as we said uh, at the beginning, it was one one battle, but the war is still on. They are still coming up with similar ideas under different names. And uh, so um, it's a, a process. Uh, we know that we didn't win, but we feel that we are on the way to win in the not defined future. It's great to have some uh, optimistic views. <laughs> uh, Mateus, maybe you can tell us um, why code? Why did you feel the need to, to create such a structure? And what are maybe you, your key successes? And where do you stand now in this um, Polish situation which uh, keeps being difficult? Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, chrono chronologically, I should be probably the first, but uh, because COD has already 18 months, uh, it's twice as old as uh, women's strike. But uh, to give you some uh, uh, landscape before, before I will speak about COD, before last elections for eight years, the, the Poland was governed by the civic platform uh, in a coalition with the uh, Farmers Party. And uh, almost all the economical um, measures were quite well. Uh, even during the times of crisis in Poland, we didn't, had, uh, we didn't really experience the crisis. We had quite good situation. We were called even the Green Island on the map of, of Europe because it was the only country where there was no crisis. And, uh, but somehow people needed the change, some kind of change. People before the elections were expecting the change. And I think that the, uh, there is a funny story which a friend of mine told me once why people needed the change, why didn't they didn't uh, they were not happy with the success of the country. And it was uh, an example of the toilets on the train stations. But of course, during the communist period, you know probably how it looked. It was impossible to use them. But then it was better and better and better. And then a few years ago, someone entered the toilet on the train station and said, oh, it's really great. It's much better than my home. And this is probably the problem, that people saw that the country is developing, but it forgot about the people. And the people, therefore, needed the change because they wanted some kind of participation in the global success of the country. So, uh, after the last elections, uh, the Populistic Party, uh, uh, Law and Justice, won the elections. They got um, absolute majority having only 37% of votes. This was some kind of uh, few small accidents who uh, uh, added each, to each other, uh, caused a global uh, failure. And the, the party used during the campaign national uh, narration and uh, socialist programs, so this, you know, this connection of national, nationalism and socialism is always a bit dangerous. And uh, finally, uh, just after the elections, people started to see that they are not going to realize exactly what they said during the campaign, but they started to dismantle the, uh, all the uh, democratic institutions, to proprietize the, the, the institutions. And uh, it was very quick that people were, became very angry. Uh, this was not caused by any economical uh, measures because it was just a few days after the, government, the new government was created that people started to be really very angry. They, didn't, didn't, they couldn't watch the TV, they couldn't watch the, uh, the sessions of the parliament because it was so uh, d disgusting. The, 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 there was no, the, all the debate was stopped. There was no possibility to, to speak about anything. They just behaved like, you know, uh, they won and they took everything. 
And just uh, the, the elections were on 25th uh, September, uh, October. Uh, and on the 16th November, the new government was pro uh, proclaimed. And uh, on 18th no November, the uh, uh, publicist wrote an article, we have to create code. And on 19th November, I read this article. And uh, after some uh, talks with my friends, I created a group on Facebook. It was Thursday. And on Monday, it was more than 30,000 people in this group, people coming and saying that we want to create a, an organization. We want to go to the streets. We want to protest. We have our um, experience, we, we know how to do, but we should go together. And here I, I have to, exp to, to say that Michal, when was talking about God, he was a bit lying. He said it's uh, 35 plus. It's not basically the truth, it's <laughs> rather older. Um, I am 49 and I'm one, one of the younger people in COD. Of course, we have uh, also some youth. <laughs> we have some people of 20, 25, and so on. But basically, uh, when we are at demonstrations or at, uh, meetings, when we, if you ask people who was active in the solidarity in 1980, then uh, most of the people raised their hands. So this is, pro the, this is the movement on, of youth, but of youth from 1980 from the solidarity. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this, of course, is uh, understandable because we stand for the values. We, uh, we, do, we are not touched personally. So young people don't exactly understand everything. They don't see the parallels between the times uh, before and the, the changes that, that came now. But, of course, this uh, we have to take into account that we are a movement of rather older people. It is also because they don't have a lot to lose. If you are retired, if you have your uh, com own company, if you have your position, your children, are uh, adult and so on, then you are not so dependent on, uh, on the situation as when you are young and you, when you need to create your family, create your career, to establish family and so So pr probably this is also why we are so a bit older. Uh, since the beginning we decided to be a, a partisan, so we, don't, we are not connected with any single party, but we are of course uh, uh, in the area of in the space of politics, so we are political, politically active. Uh, we started to organize our um, activities together with all the oppositional parties, which were quite divided. Uh, and what the, the first real demonstration after two, a, sm a few small pickets was uh, just on 12th December, which was also very very quickly. It was, and uh, everyone was. Um, uh, how to say? Uh, so it was really strange for everyone that people, many people came and said, I have to come because no one will come. So I should come, be there because if there will be a very small group, then no one will see the demonstration. Finally, there was about 70,000 of people at the end, so it was quite big. And this was, uh, as before, uh, it was anger which caused us to go there. Then, then on that day, we felt joy that we are not alone, that we, are, we can do something together. We are so, uh, so numerous. And then we started to create an organization. We, we registered an uh, association. We, we had already some uh, local structures in most uh, big cities in Poland. Uh, and now, after uh, one year and a half, we are in uh, about 300 uh, places in Poland. We have organizations. We have uh, elected uh, the local um, committees to, to govern all the all the stuff, so we are quite well organized. But I think that this is not the most important. The most important thing, which, uh, which is for me uh, cause to be really happy, is uh, are the two other uh, points which pointed also Michal. One is, of course, the women's strike, and the second is the uh, educational uh, protest, the group of people who organized the protest uh, against the reform of education. Because in both those um, initiatives, there are many people from COD. There are uh, people who just learned in COD that you can be active, you can do something when you, when you want to, that if you believe in something, you should go and uh, show this uh, on the streets if it's necessary. And I think this is our main success, that the people started to be active. They believe that they can do something, that they can change something, they can inf influence somehow the, um, the situation. Of course, we have not any big successes as 
still the uh, law and justice parties uh, destroying the democracy and the, uh, the system itself. Uh, but uh, we had many smaller successes. We stopped them with some initiatives, uh, with some um, bills that they wanted to introduce in the parliament and they finally rejected. Mm. But yeah, but I think that the, our main success is the activity of, uh, of other people uh, regarding to specific problems as I said, the women's, uh, the women's strikes, the educational protests. There are also some other issues that are now raising and people who learned from, uh, from code how to organize the, who, uh, this kind of activity, people who uh, understood that is possible. And also we call this, we created some kind of uh, protest infrastructure. <laughs> This, uh, of course, in the inter 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 intellectual manner, but also uh, in the physical manner. We have some loudspeakers. We, ha we know how to organize the scenes. We know how to transport all the stuff. We know how to organize the security service on the demonstrations. So, so this is something that we learned, and we, we can now serve to, to other organizations, to other people, and to, <laughs> to other problems. Thank you very much. It's very interesting. Uh, <clears throat> maybe, uh, Andrea, you can tell us a bit about Romania, because it was the surprise. It, we did not expect that there is a fire in a club, and then there is no more the government. And it was out of the blue for us looking from outside. And I'm sure you can explain to us how this is possible, where it comes from. and because you had a complicated sequence in the past two years. Uh, what's going on now? Mm -hmm. uh, hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, sorry, my English is not the best. Uh, I hope you will understand me. Um, I will try to speak uh, about uh, our uh, biggest protest from uh, 2012 uh, till now uh, about uh, the reason, their main results, their main, main failures uh, and the main narratives and also about uh, what is happening now in Romania, the burning issue on the public agenda and um, what, is, what happens after protest uh, and actually more centered by uh, on our new political parties because so we have this context, uh, context in Romania. We have some new political party that, that uh, were developed in uh, the last two years. Um, I will uh, I will start with uh, the first civic protest that uh, was in 2012 uh, was an anti-austerity protest uh, against um, was started um, by a law proposed by the neoliberal government uh, laws that uh, wants to privatize uh, our emergency health service um, and then. Um, was uh, developed uh, on uh, anti-austerity policies uh, that uh, were um, were taken by the government uh, during uh, during that mandate, um, and uh, we have results. Uh, we have stopped the law, and uh, we have changed the government. Um, this was the main result and um, the uh, indi indi indirect result was that uh, was the first time when in Romania uh, people from academia, people, uh, normal citizens were um, get connected and uh, build uh, networks and uh, also was very important that or, uh, was the first time when uh, the subject of uh, inequality, inequality was addressed in public space and uh, also the participative democracy uh, and also um, uh, was uh, for the first time when we had in Romania a civic protest, not protest uh, powered by unions or uh, organized groups. Um, the second protest was uh, in 2000, um, in, um, 2013, and uh, was um, was against a mining a gold mining corporation uh, who uh, 
wants to uh, explode uh, our goal which you need uh, was uh, more on an environment issue, in environmental issue, issue and was quite uh, different uh, for, from the first one. Um, we try, uh, we get together um, a lot of people from corporations, from uh, civic activist academia, but uh, even uh, the nation, the people on the extreme right wing uh, had come with us uh, to protest them. Uh, was a very heterogeneous group. Um, we had a result at that time also. We tried, uh, we actually, we, um, we stopped the mining corporation to explode our gold. Um, but what I want to point out uh, about this case that um, then uh, has started um, a struggle between uh, the groups, the, the activists, a struggle for the main narrative that uh, we, uh, we promote in the public space. And uh, we had like uh, three, um, three groups. Uh, one of uh, progressive left that uh, was uh, more against corporation uh, pro um, protecting the environmental protection. Uh, one that claims that uh, corruption is the biggest problem and uh, that uh, um, that uh, everything is happened because uh, the government is corrupt. And uh, the third one, uh, the conservative neo legioner that uh, said that we want to protect our uh, land and uh, that uh, the foreigners want to come and take our gold and stuff like this. And um, and that started the, uh, the struggle. I, I think that uh, for that moment, um, industries, we, we were, we were, um, I don't know. Uh, we were have the power to the message uh, because uh, we were on the street with the megaphone. All the slogans were given by us, uh, but um, but the right wing, liberal wing, uh, never um, never forgot this thing, and. Uh, and then in the next protest uh, that were uh, in uh, 2014 uh, with the collective and when the, the club has burned, um, well, there was an October night and a uh, club, uh, club with rock music has burned in Romania. Uh, over 60 young people had died. And uh, everybody was in was shocked by uh, by what what uh, had what what had happened there. And um, two days later, uh, another civic activist uh, has made a page, a Facebook page, who uh, with the name "The Corruption Kills," and uh, they said that uh, the club uh, has burned because the authorities uh, were actually, were, um, were, were, were were they gave the uh, legal authorization exactly. even if it was respecting was not respecting the rules because of the corruption. Exactly. And uh, then were. All the people go goes in the street, and uh, everybody said that corruption kills. Uh, that that was the trigger and the connection uh, of the Burnit Club with the corruption issue. Um, it was difficult for us to 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 give another perspective and another narrative, because uh, in that moment uh, nobody from the media was um, was taking attention to us to the leftist activist. Uh, and uh, practically, practically, the uh, the right wing uh, has monopolized all the public discourse. And uh, they um, another thing that uh, has happened um, at the, the moment uh, was a moment to criticize the traditional parties. To this, this is was a good issue from my point of view. Uh, and then the results of this project pro protest was the, that uh, we changed the government, uh, the social democrats 
that are not real social democrats. Um, we changed the government and uh, there was a new government by, formed by technocrats, technocrat people, uh, who are, were main issue was um, good governance and uh, improvement of the institutional of the state. They are not corrupted, they are, um, I don't know, um, they are experts, uh, they, are look, they are working with data and stuff like this. Um, everything was quietly okay. We tried, like, an, like activists, we tried to criticize them, to criticize the, uh, the, um, the technocrat government, but uh, again, um, nobody from media and nobody from, um, from the influencers uh, was no uh, hurting uh, us. Um, then we had uh, elections. Um, we had elections. Uh, the Social Democrats were, were elected again with a huge majority in Parliament. Um, and then in, this was in November last year. Uh, now in um, uh, in January, they wanted to pass a law uh, that. Um, that practically um, decriminal, decriminalize corruption. And uh, they give that law uh, in the night, it was uh, 10 p.m., uh, was January, was min minus 20 degrees. Uh, when everybody was at home looking at the television, they passed the law, everybody go in the streets, um, there was no taxi, no metro, but uh, we were, was, was a great night that uh, we, uh, <laughs> we were like uh, 20,000 uh, 20, just in Bucharest, in every city uh, from our country, people get out in the street. Um, and uh, well, probably you have seen the, that picture with the lighters uh, and uh, um, well, this is the, uh, the nice, part of uh, that protest. And also the nice part is that um, the huge mobilization of citizens were uh, 200,000 just in Bucharest, uh, half million in all the street. Uh, and I want to point out that were a lot of cities where, uh, where and at that time was the first protest, uh, the first protest since, uh, Okay, um, and, but the bad, the bad part was uh, that um, was uh, all the protest was sustained by a weak narrative, a narrative that was based only on anti-corruption issue. Um, we, mm, there was nothing more than this. Nothing, nothing, not a vision about, uh, not a vision for society. Um, not, a, not a way, we couldn't criticize the, the, uh, uh, the, the political model or the political regime uh, or things like this. Um, uh, yes, and it uh, was uh, another, another uh, thing that was that um, in the last let's say three years, uh, they, uh, how to say, the neoliberals, media and influencers uh, were um, putting us outside the protest and trying to delegitimize, uh, delegitimize us and uh, tell that uh, we have uh, our own interest and uh, want to stall the movement and uh, then were, was very hard for us to to, to promote our discourse and uh, our values uh, on the protest. Uh, but, um, let's see, uh, another specific issue in the context of Romania is that uh, if you say that you are a leftist, everybody say uh, that you uh, are a communist. Everybody is um, main, um, post-traumatic syndrome, I don't know how to say, uh, but, um, but it was very hard for us uh, in the last years to, to declare, well, 
we declare our, ourselves that we are leftists and our values are in new left and trying to to build a new narrative in Romania but uh, everyone from the uh, the old media and the old parties uh, is uh, trying to to uh, push a button every time we we declare our political identity um, Yes, another thing, uh, our burning issue now in Romania uh, is that uh, we had a, a coalition for family, for a traditional family, exactly the case of Croatia, the same model, the same thing. Uh, they started a petition last year and uh, they have three million signatures uh, to um, for to promote uh, the marriage just for a man and a woman and to change uh, change our constitution so uh, the conservative uh, wave uh, is, um, is 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 com it comes in Romania also um, the biggest problem is that uh, all our political parties sustain this coalition and the position of this coalition. We don't have uh, until now any parliamentary uh, political party that, um, that uh, assume a progressive uh, agenda or a progress progressive values on this, uh, on this subject. Um, the good part is that uh, two days ago we launched a platform, a counter action, um, a platform it calls respect uh, the platform for um, for rights and liberties and uh, it's formed it is formed uh, by uh, 100 NGOs and uh, we try to um, to develop a new type of discourse and um, and um, and not to resume this issue on gay marriage, and uh, but to to take the, the narrative more more than this, uh, more than this. And um, yes, and regarding uh, our new political parties, um, well, uh, we have uh, we had a European mental election uh, last time. Um, a group uh, formed uh, after the protest, the network, uh, has started a campaign to boycott the elections. Uh, we said that we don't go to vote, these political parties doesn't represent us, uh, we, we, we don't want to vote. And uh, after that we made a coalition, we made advocacy, and um, we, tr we, uh, we succeed to change our electoral law, um, if uh, before that uh, we had a threshold um, for, with uh, 200,000 signatures to form a political party, now in Romania you can form a political party with just three members. And uh, was, um, <laughs> yes, like an NGO, uh, and, no. uh, and uh, it's, um, it was a political effervescence, I can say. Um, there, there is a new political party form, formed um, two years ago uh, that has started in Bucharest, but now is, deve is uh, developed in our country. It calls uh, uh, Save Romania Union, um, and um, they. Uh, had a problem, I don't know, I, I think that this is a problem, they think that this is okay. Uh, they didn't assume any ideology and any values. Uh, their aim is just uh, to, to attack the corruption and uh, good government issues, but they don't say we are on social values or uh, neoliberal values or they are uh, progressive or conservatives or uh, stuff like this. And uh, they get a 10 percentage uh, of the votes on the parliamentary. Uh, they are now there, uh, but, um, uh, but 
uh, now, for example, it's a big issue because they don't uh, they, they don't want uh, to uh, to position against the coalition for family. They they don't want to take a, a clear position uh, on any burning issue. Um, and uh, my case, uh, we formed a political party also. It calls uh, Demos, uh, the platform for democracy and solidarity, uh, and uh, is the first uh, is the first new left uh, new leftist party from Romania. Um, we are people from that that. Uh, activists, we are people from the academia, we are, uh, now we try to um, to get with us uh, people from another social, social categories. Um, and uh, we, we have started this platform uh, in September last year. Uh, now we have like 300 members um, and, um, and Practically, uh, our main aim is to build another another narrative uh, to to show that uh, the left wing can be clean, uh, can be the left wing doesn't mean communism, it doesn't mean corruption. Uh, to show that uh, social values can go hand to hand uh, with uh, uh, with civil rights and liberties and with the progressive agenda, and. Uh, we hope that uh, in the next uh, European election we'll be we'll get some place. Uh... Thank you, Andrea. <clears throat> Thank you. <coughs> so, going back to the introduction from uh, Igor this morning and the different strategies, we clearly see uh, examples. Really, uh, it's very striking. Actually, very. A concrete practical illustration of what uh, we were talking this morning in the choices you, you, you all made. Uh, maybe we can talk now about the, the burning issue you had in Tuzla yeah. <laughs> in 2014, <laughs> but not concentrating on the anecdote, m maybe a bigger context about the the, the, the movement, we showed also the, the video, it was a bit mysterious maybe for people who don't know, it was the bit of the video without subtitles, without explanation. Um, so maybe give us the, the clues, the keys to understand what we saw and then tell us about uh, what you are trying to do, how you see the situation now for the, the citizens and uh, resistance in Bosnia. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Actually, what you saw was wonderfully curated, that you didn't see the burning building, the, the government building that was burned down, um, accidentally or not, I cannot say why. But, I mean, this kind of, this type of violence was very important for us to be um, claimed and defended and not to be shunned away from precisely because those institutions that were burned down represented the seeds of clientelistic and nepotistic networks and we claimed um, the creative uh, dimension of that kind of violence. Um, I mean, people like Martin Luther King would actually talk about it as, um, as, as a non-violent action, you know, through burning. Um, but it's, it, it was really important. How, how, how do you read that? How do you read these kind of protests in Bosnia that um, took everybody by surprise, particularly in Tuzla? Um, but you cannot start unless you um, map the abject poverty into which Bosnia has been driven um, in the past, well, since, since the signing of, of, of the Dayton Peace Agreement. Um, millions, millions and millions were poured into the reconstruction of, of um, the government, of good governance, of all these kind of techn technocratic models, uh, completely disregarding the questions of how people live. Um, whether they starve. I mean, the city I come from, Tuzla, uh, is one of, of abject poverty in which young people under 35, uh, their levels of unemployment is 70%. Those are the figures of Gaza. And to live in this kind of post-industrial dystopia means also to try and figure out the models of, of 
really going back to, to, to basics. And I think, I think that's, what, that, that's one of the major lessons learned. You know, how do you go back to basics in order to, to revive some sort of um, action for equality and justice? Because those are the two main you know, drivers. And um, the protests actually escalated in 2014, but fortunately in Tuzla we had a solid basis built onto which plenums could be organized and protests could be organized properly, even though it was very difficult to, to organize protests. So I don't, I mean, you know, I wouldn't even claim they were organized um, because you, you cannot organize such huge events. Um, but we started working with um, one particular factory, Dita factory, the detergent factory, that stands in the middle of a desolate place that once was a huge industrial sector. Other factories surrounding Dita are completely stripped of assets. Uh, workers are unemployed. They are, they are not there anymore, and it stands really as this solitary factory that, that somehow managed to, um, to resist. So, you know, protesting in 2011, we, we realized that um, it, was, it was really stunning that the entire city looks at these people who live in the city as if they were aliens. You know, they are now fighting for something when they can actually see that everything is foregone. You know, it's just yet another struggle and, you know, you know, people are tired. There's this actually produced languor and tiredness and exhaustion that's called democratic deficit, but actually it's a, it, it is governing people through poverty. It is creating these docile bodies that are well trained into the way of the capital, right? to accept helplessness, to accept flight into solitary space, to accept that there is no possibility. So we decided to evacuate the university into the factory. The position was that um, the university as it is, is an empty shell. Uh, it is completely idiotic and it needs to be where the barricades are because that is the only proper way to to actually constitute a university. Having thus constituted the university at the barricades, we encountered the situation of the Dita occupied factory being such that people who fought for the factory, 75 workers, built a trench in front of the factory. So it was a wartime situation. Structurally, if you analyze the space, the space was organized as a front line. There was nobody to come in or leave the factory. So the trenches were there. So if you actually have this kind of you know, organization of space, you have, to, you have to really go back to the war and see how the context of Bosnia is an unresolved war and what you do with that. You know, it was very sexy in 96, immediately after the war in, in, in Bosnia, to have these kind of psychosocial project to, uh, to deal with the trauma, 97, 98, 98 already you started having these kind of seductive lures of economic growth, you know, the figures, that are the, the drivers, and um, by 99 you have the stability pact that is probably the most detrimental thing ever created um, in former Yugoslavia, and this stability pact meant that you couldn't, you had to stop talking about the effects of the war, but you had to focus now somehow on development. You know. Well, not, not just the future, just the, just the development, right? And this kind of development, just like the Dayton Peace Accords, was built onto the structure that in the international arena shifted the complete paradigm. So today, internationally, you have two basic postulates, war pays and genocide pays. So you can actually commit that. And based on this kind of political economy of war and genocide, you build development. Of course, you're going to get a monster that you know, cannot be withstood. So you're faced 
with these kind of figures of unemployment, if you want them graphically. And on the other hand, you have, you have 87 people in Bosnia and Herzegovina who own collectively $9 billion. 87 people, right? While people rummage through dustbins to eat, right? So, you know, in, these kind of, in this kind of situation, in this kind of you know, unresolved war, which actually the part of the unresolved war is the, is the, is the is the civil war or class war. I mean, actually, every, every civil war is the class war. So I think that's something that, that we need to address uh, very soon. So what we encountered in Data Factory, this kind of wartime situation, is what these people had to invent, drawing on their experiences of the Bosnian war and of them defending themselves and their families, of how this defense of the means of production is maintained. What they were saving, they were saving the machinery that was otherwise would have been taken out of the factory, would have been dissolved, sold, God knows what, and then the factory would have been just an empty shell that could be then sold as, you know, land. Land is a big thing. As I, you know, I'll come back to that. So, structurally you had a wartime situation. So what we encountered was another interesting thing, and I think for, for political philosophy and for organization, is the driver, is going to be the driver for the 21st century. So these workers of Data Factory claimed the following. They said, we are not on strike, but we are in protest for production. So this entire phrase, to be in protest of production, is fantastic, right? So they are fighting to keep on producing. They're fighting to be able to live on their work. They're fighting actually amidst this post-industrial decay to maintain production. So of course the question that structurally had to be posed was, so what does it mean to have this collective that is in protest for production and how do we enlarge this, this collective and how do we invite people into this kind of um, uh, collective. So we had, you know, we had a couple of years before 2014 to think about that and to maintain regularly, on daily basis, work. And that's something that cannot be forgotten and that this is the most difficult and most arduous thing. You have to be working and be at a factory every day, which means bringing the food, talking to the workers, trying to understand <coughs> what happened. And this is something that for years we have been trying to develop the story and to reconstruct the story of what happened. How did it come about that they managed to put up the fight for the factory and how did it come about that other workers from the surrounding factories gave up, right? Which is actually the history of the war because during that time we realized the privatization started amidst the war in the most difficult year during the war, which was 94, when nobody could enter Sarajevo, when the decision of privatization of state-owned, of socially-owned property, you know, was, was then actually proclaimed a state-owned property by a handful of people who were there in Sarajevo and who then had a particular interest. Of course, based on this is, is another trauma of, of of Bosnian war, the one that is not talked about, and this is the whole idea of the joint Bosnia and Herzegovina and the struggle of, of, for the joint Bosnia and Herzegovina and the acceptance of the ethnic division of Bosnia and Herzegovina, the coming of Mujahideens, etc., etc. So, right? I mean, this kind of, you know, uh, complicates the situation further. So, based on all of this, based on working with the workers constantly, with the students, with artists, activists, academics, um, we, we, we had a solid basis to try and think when the protests galvanized um, how to sharpen the struggle, right? How to um, build on what the previous years brought in terms of protests. And this is, you had various types of protests like Yema um, Bagger protests, protests for babies to be signed in the, in the book registers, protests for various workers. But at this point you had some sort of an understanding and a joint connection amongst people that the struggle of these data workers and other companies who were protesting in front of the government was the struggle of all these people, young people in particular, who actually had no future in their country. 
and whose only future was either going to be to go in Iraq and Afghanistan to service American wars, right? Or to actually leave the country and you know, retrain what's happening now, um, to retrain as medical workers, right? And to go to Germany and, and, and you know, basically work as, as care workers to, you know, as, as, as medical assistants. So, uh, with this kind of understanding, the question was what kind of horizon of, of utopian horizon do we offer this kind of community? You know, what is it that we fight for, not just against? So, this phrase, the protest for production, was very kind of productive to try and think what it is that we protest to produce. Right? Um, protest took place, government building got burned down, you know, we had series of manifestos as another genre that kind of mobilized people around various demands, primarily to reverse this kind of, to reverse privatization and corruption through privatization and theft, legitimized theft through the laws um, of this. So in other words, actually the question is how do you, how do you claim justice? Um, we had the case of plenums. Of course, plenums were these public events in which people could try and make decisions um, through this kind of what, was, what is called horizontal way of, of governance. Um, plenums, you know, it's, it's kind of very easy to be, to be clever uh, after the event. Um, but they're very important, I think, for two, for two reasons. One is that plenums rescued politics itself. That politics was not to be left to those who have the worst passionate intensity to deal with it, but actually the politics is at the core of life. And I think that plenums brought about this kind of understanding. Um, they were also very therapeutic because for a long time, it's not true that actually people don't get, want, want to get involved in politics. People do want to get involved in politics. It is how do you move the politics away from the clientelistic uh, corrupt networks. So the therapy part of politics, because any good politics is either therapeutic or it doesn't exist, it is this kind of great sense of what you talked about as this kind of liberation, the, the great sense of you know, achievement, Borka talked about it as this kind of eroticism, right? Sorry? Yes, and you were in Tuzla, of course. I mean, there is this kind of great libidinal discharge that, that proper politics enables. Um, and it, that's very important because, because I think, I think the, the danger of all these localized actions is that we are call, caught in this kind of masturbatory process of trying to, you know, be, you know, self complacent because it's kind of very easy to have this kind of action, short action, short discharge, and that's it, right? No, but I mean, but, but this kind of greater copulation, if you want, as politics occurs when you ma start making connections. And actually, the, the, you know, I think we bypass this, this masturbatory logic of, of, of action into some sort of making of connections. And this is why people felt like it was New Year's, right? During protests and plenums, people were great. They're like, wow, something is happening. This is like New Year's. You start meeting new people and, you know, it's great. Uh, and I think that's something really to, to, to be cognizant of um, and to be mindful of to, when it comes to organization, to really make space for, these, um, for this kind of affect that is uh, brought about. The obverse side of it, of course, is a negative a uh, destructive effect that you unleash immediately with any sort of political action. And I think, you know, th th I mean, this is something that we, um, it, was, it, was, it was too huge to manage. It was too huge to, you know, to kind of, to, to, to drive. And I think um, what was very important to understand is how we are, consciously or unconsciously, the conduits of privatization affect. And I think how we um, manage to consciously or unconsciously uh, 
undermine and self-sabotage. And I think that's also another very important lesson for political activism of, of being mindful of, of self-sabotage, political self-sabotage. Um, with that said, I think we continued working, obviously, with the workers. And of course, DITA is the only now success story in, in, in Yugoslavia as the factory that started the production uh, when it was uh, under bankruptcy. Um, you know, it was under receivership. It managed to pull through now. You know, a month ago, it was bought by a good owner who maintained the production, but actually the struggle stays when it comes to trade union organization, when it comes to actually keeping the whole question alive for the community to keep these kind of struggles um, not perforated, but actually connected. Um, so another thing is the question is, how do you claim justice in all of this? Um, uh, process. Uh, one of the things that we are, we are driving through as part of the Workers' University and why we called ourselves the Workers' University was to continue the platform of this kind of public learning and activity and sharing in which we can devise models of organization, be they kind of very hardcore or be they, you know, just as public classrooms to really keep decolonizing the space and time for political action, because that's something that's been colonized by the ethno-national uh, ethno elites. Um, and this whole question of decolonization of space and time for political action is a big one. Also, that's, that's another question of how we decolonize the right to violence. That's a, that's a big topic. Um, but, you know, really how you continue um, increasing this community of of protest for production and what that means at every new sequence of the struggle, which means that you have to start building the infrastructure uh, properly. Um, my concern is, and, and that's something that I would like to bring to the table, is you know, we are conduits of privatization effect. We have to figure out how we resist gossip that kind of undermines, I mean, that, that's something that, that you know, how we remind this, uh, how we uh, undermine this um, great pull and push from all sides to undermine everything that could be productive, right? Internationally, nationally, locally. Um, how do you kind of fight this? Um, I mean, Benjamin would talk about it as acedia of the heart, right? How do you uh, fight this kind of melancholy? How do you fight that actually there is no alternative? And how do you produce and practice every day amongst people who you work with that there is a different way of being together, acting together, that you do not have to accept to be bribed by the ethnonationalist elites, right? And you know, this whole concept of the unbribable life is something that we have to, have to work towards. Also, the question is, how do you build a structure that is very agile and that is quick to respond in these times to come? Because, you know, what we have, I mean, you know, all these protests, I mean, whilst I was watching the happening of the masses in the streets, um, I mean, it's very fuzzy and problematic, I mean, you know. Um, I mean, the problem is that is the that's a symptom of a restructuring of the capital, right? And how do we respond to this by building international agile forms of being able to respond swiftly, not just in in a very particular lo locality, which I think is very important to build these kind of very specific strategies for the problems, but how do you start driving the process, and how do you start actually? separating the space of what it is that we talk about and what it is that we don't talk about. I mean, you know, look, look at us, we are sitting here surrounded by, by what hasn't been prosecuted by, you know, I mean, you know, I, I live in a country where there are still hidden mass graves, and these hidden mass graves are a great investment of ethno-nationalist elites. Whilst they are hidden, they'll remain, remain in power, right? Because all of this is connected. How do you start merging all these struggles together? And how do you start um, talking about that the coming to terms with the past is also the question of the theft of socially owned property. That is the, 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 the question of the destitution. That is the question of poverty. Why do we need this poverty? Who it is for? 
right? And I think the, these workers have, have built um, concepts and methods of struggles that, that we can actually draw on and, and start developing. So my concern is how do we as networks um, sharpen the struggle? How do we drive it? How do we push and attack? And how do we then maintain um, the, the, the joint work? Because what was impossible and why the entire situation escalated, in Tuzla in particular, was that the brutality of the police attack was unseen. So that was the bottom line. If I survived the war, there isn't anybody who will let shoot at me ever again because I will shoot back. And I will not just be a passive victim to accept this kind of violence as normal. And that is, that is the bottom line. And I think young people in particular felt that. Um, that there was this consternation and fear that this kind of attack could happen, but actually that, that it is your right and responsibility to, to fight back. Thank you, Damir. It was truly food for thought. Uh, tomorrow in the afternoon, we will all be together in a plenum. So we will truly experiment. Uh, Igor and you, Damir, were really speaking strongly about it. So it is going to be our life experience, our plenum experience. <clears throat> uh, going back now to to Belgrade. Uh, Luba, maybe you can tell us the story of the Nedavimo Belgrade because we saw the, the video at the beginning. Some people here have made allusions because they are very well informed. I think others are know much less. So maybe give us a bit of the, the context of why this movement, how did it achieve the, the success of being so strong and where it needs to go now? Well, okay, more or less, well, thank you first for having me here, of course, and for all of your speeches. But more or less, um, a lot of things that we heard now in this panel are also our story. I'm trying to say how, in a way, we all are dealing with the same issues and same problems, and yeah, it's interesting how it, uh, everything overlaps, but it's so, so specific at the same time. Uh, with Nedavimo Beograd, do not let Belgrade drown. Uh, it all uh, started three, three, three years ago uh, when this Belgrade waterfront project was uh, presented for the second time, actually, during the second uh, election campaign, because the first one uh, failed for those who were uh, trying to get those, the places. So in this uh, election campaign, uh, we were, the public was presented this Belgrade Waterfront project, but only uh, through these shiny images and uh, these big announcements and so on, uh, um, it was actually presented to be a, a, a big capital investment that would uh, get Serbia out of crisis, so to say. So that was like the accident. Uh, we're going to rebuild a, a huge part of the city, but in order to, of course, make our city beautiful and so on. But in, uh, the accent was on getting the, uh, making the uh, working places to seize the unemployment rate and to uh, get Serbia out of crisis. Uh, soon after the elections, the, the SNS party who presented the project won. So uh, the investor was presented, the Eagle Hills co company from Abu Dhabi, and their master plan. So uh, what we saw in the media uh, was this uh, huge master plan of uh, central area of Belgrade on the right bank of Sava River that, was, uh, that included it, uh, almost two million square meters construction area, over 6,000, it was offering over 6,000 residential units, units 12,000 office, office uh, workers, eight hotels, and so on. So this, um, let's say, luxury uh, housing uh, uh, office 
uh, area with the biggest shopping mall in the Balkans and so on. And um, uh, what was also presented at that time was that uh, the, the investor, the Seagull Hills Company, will invest uh, around three billion uh, dollars or euros, depending which media do you follow. Uh, they will invest this amount of money to this project and to Belgrade and to Serbia. And this way, on this basis, it was announced, it was declared as a project of um, national importance. Uh, that's really important to emphasize because uh, that national importance actually uh, gave, let's say, right to this project to, um, to put it simple, to be put in uh, above uh, our Belgrade and Serbia laws, uh, regu uh, regulations, plans, and so on. Uh, after the elections, we had this period of this strong promotional campaign when, uh, where this project was presented uh, strictly through media and in this positive light. So there was absolutely, absolute lack of any critical thought of uh, any public debate or even some official documents, analysis and so on. Uh, my impression is that at first people, uh, public, didn't react that much in this because uh, we have seen all of this before. This is nothing new. It was in bigger scale. But it was something that happened before. You have elections, you have this like big project announcement, unemployment rate, and so on. This scenario happened before, but then after the elections, nothing happened. But this time, a uh, couple of months after the elections, they announced uh, uh, the first changes, uh, that the general plan of Belgrade is going to be changed. That's like a, like a constitution for a country. That's what the general plan uh, is for this urban planning. So they announced the changes of uh, this plan in order to meet the, the master plan propositions. So instead of uh, changing the master plan in order to meet the proposition, the, the vision and studies how Belgrade should be developed, we have a different situation, the other way around. And that's the first time where a um, group of uh, people who formed initiative later uh, gathered. So. Um, it was actually a, a, a group of individuals and organizations who uh, got together in order to, uh, well, actually to have a voice in these changes and to, to act on, uh, to try to be heard on how the Belgrade is gonna be, how the planning of Belgrade is gonna be changed and what's gonna happen with our city, with our future and so on. Uh, of course, uh, that didn't give many results in terms that the plan, the general urban plan was changed and, uh, and the, what happened afterwards is that we have months and months of implementing this project uh, in terms of changing the, the other plans and uh, uh, bringing this lex specialis, so to see law above law in order to, to uh, expropriate the land to evict the people who live there and so on in order to implement the project. Uh, from that day on, I can say, we started to work as an initiative, like the citizen initiative, uh, Nedavimo Beograd. Sorry? Yes, after, I'm gonna get to, to that, yes. Uh, and our main, uh, I can say that our main goals at that time were uh, first to find out what's happening uh, regarding this project because the information was basically unavailable to the public. Uh, to find out what's happening, to uh, to make uh, to raise public awareness and to act. So yeah, one of the actually the first public debate on this project happened here in Tuzakadu, where we called the uh, uh, experts from five different fields to uh, uh, to research on on the the project and on the future plans and to discuss. So. Um, in the following months, uh, I can say that we were uh, thinking of and trying all uh, different ways of acting on what's happening. So we have tried this, uh, uh, let's say, uh, public debates and talks. We, we, uh, we were research, researching the project. We founded the like, Facebook social media uh, entities, like Facebook page, uh, Twitter, and so on, trying to inform people what's happening 
We also started with direct actions and uh, organizing protests, uh, getting into the city municipality and interrupting the, um, their meetings and so on. Uh, because uh, it's uh, important to, to, to emphasize that our uh, media is highly censored. So uh, it was very hard to uh, uh, get attention, like media attention and therefore public attention to what's happening with this project and uh, to raise awareness and to get a critical uh, voice into public, into public sphere. Um, so, uh, I can, it's kind of funny because I can actually compare like uh, our approach to some, I would say, uh, some basic, uh, uh, how do you call it, marketing approach in a way that uh, we, were we were actually, I don't think we were aware at the moment, but we were actually using this, uh, uh, let's say, marketing tools to uh, get the attention to what's happening. So. Um, we uh, invented this big yellow duck as our, uh, how do you call it, mascot. And uh, the point, the idea was to, I mean, the duck in Serbian also means fraud. To, so the idea was to uh, create something that's like really, let's say, uh, big and funny in a way that uh, will actually get, uh, that it actually like look good in the pictures. So the media is going to report about it. So we were actually using this like little tricks First of all, to get the media attention and then to get like public attention, so to say. So uh, in the following, uh, for the first, yeah, I can say like the first year, the first two years actually, we spent in uh, uh, being active on all the possible fields we could think of in, like I said, uh, finding out what's happening and, uh, uh, and uh, inform public about it and uh, trying to think of ways of to, to get uh, public involved. Because um, it's also, I think Damir was saying about it, um, uh, the problem is that uh, what we have here, uh, our focus is on Belgrade waterfront project and on this area, but of course uh, it's way more than uh, uh, one project and a couple of buildings and construction site and whatever, because uh, what we felt and what we think is that, uh, and I'm sure you all agree, that uh, the way our uh, city is being developed, that's a highly political question and that's, uh, uh, let's say, a mirror to society. So basically what we saw here is this, this, this Belgrade Waterfront project is uh, just, um, how to say, uh, one example of uh, everything that's happening with our society. And we have chosen that as our field to act and to try to change uh, this entire uh, manner of how the society is being led, how the political parties, political party, uh, one here, is, um, uh, let's say, uh, how do you call it, say, how do you say, um, uh, I'm liking the word in Serbian even, but that, never mind. Uh, how they, um, I can't say, it, it's privatizing the, the, the land and the city and our lives, but it's not only privatizing, it's like being vouchers on uh, taking, uh, uh, trying to figure out ways to take uh, everything that belongs to uh, public or society and has some value and put it, like take it for their own uh, profit. So, um, and, uh, and, just, yeah, and, and destroy the, uh, actually the seeing city as a prey. I mean, that's, that's basically the point. And seeing the society uh, uh, funds and everything as a prey. So, uh, at first, I can say that this was like about Belgrade Waterfront project, like focused on, on this project. And um, people started to get involved, but like we did protest, uh, all kind of protests for uh, when they were signing the contract one year after they started implementing the project, when they were uh, uh, building this uh, Sava Nova uh, luxury restaurant and presented it as a, a promotion, promotional stand that uh, is a, of temporary, that's a temporary uh, object and so on. Uh, people uh, start, started to get involved, but um, 
I think that was this smaller group of people who some of them uh, got involved uh, because uh, they cared about how our city, what's going to happen to our city, and some of them realized that that's not just about this project, it's, it, there is a whole bigger picture in it. But uh, a bit over one year ago, on 24th of April, we had the elections, and in the election night, uh, the group, a group of uh, masked people got into this uh, Belgrade waterfront area, Herzegovska Street, and demolished uh, at 2 a.m. AM, they demolished uh, all the buildings in this street. They identified uh, people who were there. They even tied uh, one guard uh, and um, uh, they took the, their mobile phones and so on. And the worst part was that the people who were there called the police and the police refused to react. So uh, at first when this happened, uh, I think that even that uh, smaller part of media that uh, were reporting on uh, our actions and uh, was given, were given like this, let's say, objective uh, image to what's happening, even they didn't believe like what happened because it was so, for us, I think even that was a bit like too much. It was really shocking. Uh, uh, we uh, acted on this, what happened. We put the yellow duck, uh, we brought it in front of the city uh, parliament and uh, we like, painted this uh, mask over it and with the question, like, who's demolishing Belgrade? Uh, one week after, our ombudsman gave an official report where he stated um, that it, it was clear uh, after this analysis that the, this was uh, organized from the top of the city government and the state government. And he even gave a transcript of this uh, police conversation, which were more than shocking. So of course, what we did, we organized a protest. And I think that was, yeah, I can say that was like the first uh, really mass, massive protest because over 20,000 people came. And um, what we tried to emphasize then, and we're still trying to, to make it clear, that everything we talked about uh, and that we were there pointing direction to in this uh, Belgrade waterfront uh, development, uh, it's the same with this demoli demolition of Herzegovska Street. That was the grand finale, so to say, of this, but that uh, it was done in the same matter and, uh, manner and it was even logical that something like that would happen. So we were trying to say that this Herzegovska Street is nothing like uh, um, separate from all of this. That's all in the same picture. And people actually, my impression is, that the public uh, uh, realized, in a good amount of public realized how uh, critical the situation is and they started to, to come to the protest, they started to organize themselves and so on. So. In the last year, we organized, I think, over seven protests or so, and they were all like uh, above 20,000 people getting out on the street and so on. And after these last elections, we had uh, one month ago or something, two months ago now, uh, presidential elections, uh, a new uh, way of protest started to organize uh, informal protests, not organized by, uh, by us, but they call it like student protests, and they were uh, they continued like for every day, for a certain period of time. So uh, what I want to say is that my feeling is that our success is um, first of all with this Herzegovska Street, this demolition, that um, by inviting people and g giving people the opportunity actually to get out on the street and raise their voice and show that they uh, do care about happen what's happening. We managed to raise awareness of the, on this topic and um, I think that the, who did it had an idea that it's just going to happen and nobody's going to notice and that obviously didn't work. So uh, this Herzegovska Street became topic even for the international uh, uh, public international community so to say and um, our uh, city mayor is resigning now and still we don't know who's responsible for it but hopefully we're, it's going to happen so um, I think the citizens have in a way showed that uh, whoever has the power can, cannot just do what they want with it. They have to be at least in certain amount responsible for what's happening. Uh, the other thing is that um, I think that uh, 
one of our main goals was to, to, to get people to be involved and to uh, uh, be active in how the, uh, this, their city is being run and, and uh, ruled. And I think that having this many people on the street and like uh, having these public debates and talks and uh, having other voices heard, we managed in, in encouraging people because I think that people here, or I'm generalizing, but in, in good amount, uh, have the feeling that there is no point in doing anything because nothing is going to change anyways. And that was one of our main agendas, so to say, to show that uh, it is important what you do because things can change. It is a long fight. It does take time and effort and so on. But I sincerely believe that uh, that's the only way to go. I mean, there is no other option, basically. Um, and also, uh, also Damir uh, has mentioned, like um, our idea, our goal is to show that um, the politics are not some dirt, dirty game or something left for these uh, people with bad intentions, but that uh, everything we do in public, that we, what everything that we do in the public sphere is a political question, and that uh, all of us. We just have to be more political and more aware of uh, the power what, uh, that we have and what we do with it. Uh, yes, so I mean, we continue with all, all of these actions, what I mentioned. This was just like a brief uh, talk about uh, Nadaimo Beograd. I didn't want to go into too many details because that would take us forever. If you want, you have a lot of stuff online so you can find out. But uh, we continue with this struggle and we continue in finding new ways of, of, uh, of acting and of, and of, let's say, fighting for uh, our rights and for, getting, for making a, a, a better society. Basically, that's the point. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Thank you Luba. Uh, Mattia, maybe you can present to us the, the, the perspectives and organizations that you are trying to build to, to build this uh, better society. Okay. Maybe you can just start oh, cool. Yeah, we hear each other. Nice. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for the invitation, obviously. Um, I don't know, I mean, uh, uh, when, when we discussed prior to the event, we discussed like more about about our uh, about the fact that we took part in this last wave of protests uh, that 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 were organized uh, after the the last rigged election in Serbia. Uh, so so I, I'm gonna I'm kind of go going to try and concentrate around that I think because it's uh, on on one hand it it. it <coughs> I think it's it's an important uh, mm, aspect of the strategy that we employ as as an activist organization. Uh, but I think it it also uh, it can relate to, to to the topics that 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 were open uh, 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 already during this panel. I uh, uh, I don't know, especially for example in case of Romania, in case of like mass movements of people that come from below that are not like organized uh, and at least that cannot be controlled uh, uh, by any particular organization within a context where the political left is pretty weak, usually very uh, uh, atomized and without any, uh, any real social or class uh, uh, rooting within, within uh, a society. Uh, so, uh, uh, how how we deal uh, with this with this issue, and I think this this last wave of, of protests, uh, especially in case of of Belgrade and Novi Sad, kind of m maybe maybe off offered something that, that can be used uh, uh, that can be basically replicated uh, as as a strategic approach uh, in this situation. Okay, so just just for, uh, first a few words about uh, the local uh, context for the uh, for friends and comrades from. Uh, outside of Serbia, uh, so uh, after the, the 5th of October revolution, which toppled the, the, the hated uh, Milosevic regime, the, the, the quasi-socialist, war-mongering nationalist, uh, but also pro-privatization and liberal, neoliberal reforms uh, kind of regime, 
we've, uh, we've, had, uh, we've had basically 12 years of various attempts of, of, of various parties uh, uh, that led this revolution uh, at, at implementing this neoliberal uh, restructuring uh, in, 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 uh, uh, in what they saw presented as, uh, as a way to, to well, bring about the prosperity of the society and all that crap. Um, this model was based on, I think, two um, uh, crucial elements. One is uh, the so-called FDI strategy, the strategy of uh, 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 trying to attract uh, foreign di direct investment. So the, the, the economic basis of, of the regime is basically, uh, uh, is basically this hardcore neoliberal uh, uh, attempt at driving down wages, workers' rights, uh, ecological uh, uh, and uh, environmental uh, uh, laws and regulations, etc., in order to make this uh, uh, um, prosperous business climate, uh, which would uh, presumably attract some uh, some uh, rich, uh, I don't know, hedge funds, uh, capitalists, or whatever from abroad, uh, that will actually invest in creating jobs and, and new opportunities and you know, the story. So that's one part uh, of the issue, and it's very connected to the, uh, to the debt economy and, and what we've experienced on the Balkans and on, on generally on, on the periphery of Europe, what, what, what has been uh, in the focus of European politics for the past few, few years, uh, uh, especially with the case of Greece, but also Italy, Portugal, Spain, Ireland, etc. So uh, there's this economical part, but then the, the more political part uh, it has been uh, uh, for during these first 12 years of the, the new liberal democratic regimes um, has been uh, the raising authoritarianism or uh, uh, the, 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 the slow decimation of democratic rights uh, of, of the population. Uh, so that was, that was the case, uh, uh, that, that was like the, 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 the sort of slowly uh, cooked frog, how do you, how do you say it? This, this, kind of, uh, this kind of situation uh, where, where, you, uh, uh, where you kind of slowly implement, uh, uh, implement the, basically the, the, the neoliberal uh, 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 medicine dictated by the IMF, the, the European Commission, what is known as Troika uh, uh, today. Um, this basically destroyed those parties. They, okay, they, they lost all of the support, and it led to, to a situation where this new party, the, the reformed Serbian Radical Party, the, the Radical Right Party, which, which went uh, all of a sudden went pro-EU and kind of uh, uh, dropped those radical right, uh, 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 radical right wing uh, uh, policies in order to become this like modern European right wing. Uh, 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 bullshit establishment party. Uh, so they, they were the, like the new political force uh, and uh, uh, the people basically chose them in order to, to uh, uh, how do you say it, to punish uh, the, 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 the previous parties. Um, but the previous parties already made this, uh, this interesting mechanism uh, within the state structure, within the, the, both the public and the private sector enterprises of basically what they call secure votes, which is, uh, which is like a network marketing kind of model where you secure votes by, uh, by uh, basically telling people they'll get fired if they don't vote for the ruling party. So once you're elected uh, on the national level, you kind of have uh, uh, pretty much the, the, the control over, over being elected again. Uh, Unless there uh, there happens to be a political party which kind of offers offers you the, the the which kind of is stable or promising enough that it actually can win win the next election, which can make people you know uh, 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 vote vote for them. Uh, but as I said, in the context of no political left, on the the context which is pretty much the same throughout the the the, the so-called post-socialist space or whatever. Uh, where, where the, 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 the very words like left or socialism, uh, communism, etc., are are vilified and have been vilified for for decades now, uh, um, and pretty much with some pretty good, you know, 
uh, uh, arguments because those regimes were everything but left and socialist. Um, so in this uh, in this kind of uh, context, uh, we uh, we 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 remain uh, now after the 2012 and especially after 2014 elections with with a situation where this this new uh, the, the Serbian Progressive Party, the Alexander Vucic party, uh, uh, is for the first time has the absolute majority in, in parliament and can do basically whatever it wants to do, and the things that it wants to do are. Well, the same things that the previous government wanted to do. It has the same program. It, it bases its 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 politics, its its, uh, 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 its the way it leads the state uh, on the same economical and political preconditions as the previous uh, post uh, uh, 2000 governments, i.e., uh, neoliberal restructuring based on the FDI model and. Uh, 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 Raising of the of the foreign debt, which is being controlled through monetary policy and through uh, through through the the, the all, like the, the whole Washington consensus kind of uh, a package of, of measures, but also on the other hand uh, on the the already existing trend of rising authoritarianism or decimating the the democratic rights, uh, and it has basically no opposition. So uh, it kind of uh, called for a couple of rounds of elections. During the the past few uh, few uh, years, uh, um, similar to what Theresa May did seven weeks ago, basically in the UK, in order to to try and and make itself more stable uh, uh, and and to, to to have basically more political power after after the election, and in a situation where you don't have oppositional parties as in Serbia, you have a situation where we, we had basically two figures. One used to be uh, that, 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 that awful creature from, from, uh, from the UN General Assembly, Vuk Jeremic, who kind of uh, 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 tried to, to gather the, the liberal right conservative kind of uh, 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 part of, uh, of the political spectrum, and on the other hand, the ombudsman, uh, uh, who was among some of the rare figures who actually openly criticized the Belgrade Waterfront project and who kind of stood up for some of the civil rights uh, uh, or media rights that, that, that have been endangered by, by the government, uh, and he, he kind of rallied around himself uh, all of those failed parties that used to govern. Serbia, but also the support of uh, of some social movements, among them also the the the, uh, the Nedaimo Belgrade movement, in some of our opinions, unfortunately. Uh, but he kind of he kind of uh, 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 um, promised uh, to be the the only guy who can actually topple topple Vucic. Uh, uh, basically, uh, what happened is. Uh, uh, Vucic won the election, uh, uh, the election again, and and uh, various uh, various examples, like a, a heap load of examples of of election fraud, uh, started uh, piling up on on, on social media, uh, and everyone. It's kind of this 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 cynical situation where everyone knows everything, but no one can do anything, and it's, it's this classical situations when you don't actually have a political leadership that can. Uh, uh, that can uh, formulate, formulate the, 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 the political issue at stake and call for action of specific type where, you know, things can either happen or they don't happen. In this case, they actually happen. And we've, had, we, we've witnessed for a couple of weeks by far like the, the biggest progressive movement that we've had in Serbia since the 5th of, 5th of October revolution with the only exception basically being, and I think this exception is very, has been very important, especially in case of Belgrade, for, for the mobilization uh, of the, 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 the demonstrations against the, the Belgrade Waterfront project. That, that was basically prior to this protest. That was the, 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 the biggest social movement that, that we've had, and it's like hats off for for everyone, you know, uh, 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 organizing organizing those protests. Um, so uh, all of a sudden, we've had uh, we've had tens of thousands of people uh, uh, in the street on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, we've had like very scattered uh, 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 um, political forces that that were unsure of how to relate uh, to the situation. 
Uh, I remember like the, f the, the first day uh, when the protest was called and it was obviously called via Facebook and th this whole uh, uh, concept uh, of previous years of, of, of having Facebook protests which are not organized by any particular <laughs> political organization, rather be, they're being called by someone who happens to make the, the, the Facebook event before anyone else and then everyone joined. Um, so I remember I, w I was pretty skeptical. Uh, uh, so we, we decided to basically send a few comrades to, to go and, and see what's happening, so, to, to see if this is some sort of you know, liberal outcry of, of those forces that, that fucked up our country and been, been fucking up our country for, for some, quite some time now and they're like, that, that were unable obviously to offer any sort of political alternative because they, it's the same political project, just different party of the ruling class. Yeah? Um, so we were kind of skeptical of, of, of what's going to happen, but what happened, what, what, what we realized is that like, it's basically thousands and thousands of, of young people, uh, uh, basically high school students and younger university students mostly, uh, who are out uh, and, uh, and pretty pissed off because what seems as like because of, of this hypocritical situation of, of, the, of the political class where, where uh, you have around 50% of, of people who go out and vote, uh, around half of that is being won by the, by the ruling party. And this is like a pattern that, that, that's been occurring throughout uh, the previous, previous years. So you have around 25% uh, deciding who will govern, and among those 25%, you know there's a huge number of people uh, who were blackmailed, who were outright blackmailed to vote in order, uh, uh, in order not to lose their jobs, because like, you know, here with, with more than 20% than 20 of, uh, of unemployment, it's kind of fucked when you lose your job. You can't really find it, and if you're young, it's pretty, it's pretty similar, like from uh, uh, throughout the whole uh, Balkan region, it's, it's kind of, is a similar situation. Youth unemployment is is very high, and general unemployment uh, is, is very is very high. So it's a pretty it's a pretty it's a pretty strong argument to blackmail someone. So so that's, uh, uh, um, in my opinion, that, that was that was that was the main drive for, for people to to go out. Okay, um, but it created a situation where you kind of want to intervene, but you're not really sure how to intervene, and you. You are in a new situation, in a situation which basically no one active on the left in Serbia ever experienced. It's, uh, you have tens of thousands of people in the street not being led by anyone, having this kind of uh, a political sensibility that you can pretty much relate to quite easily. Uh, so what do you do? Uh, already, I think, on second or no, on third night uh, of, of protests, we. Uh, uh, no, already on the second night of protest, uh, someone from uh, a, fr a friend from the from the left uh, uh, basically made a Facebook group, and uh, which started to being filled by uh, by by people who are who have been active on on the left uh, uh, here for the for the past several years or maybe up to a decade, maybe in case of some of us. Um, which is the situation which happened uh, uh, not just with the left, okay? So you, you, you had this so new situation where you have mass, mass movement not being led by anyone and people self-organizing in an attempt to offer a perspective, to, to offer, uh, to offer the, the, the idea of what the next step uh, should be. Um, so uh, uh, we basically started organizing on like the most rudimentary way uh, uh, to try and offer some political slogans and try to to basically test our ideas uh, where they should be tested, like the ideas of the left within the mass movements, and to see whether they can resonate or not. Uh, and the good thing was that we actually, I think, we did a pretty pretty damn good job because a lot of them did resonate, and and we managed to to push out the extreme right. From the front lines of the of the protest, with absolutely no effort whatsoever, which was quite new for us, and I think it's not. It's, this is also uh, an experience that, that a lot of comrades from other countries can can relate with. Um, 
So the extreme right was pushed off. Our slogans was, were, were placed in front. It wasn't done by like bullying people around us. It, was, it, was, it went quite spontaneously because those, pro, uh, those, uh, those slogans were actually not just trying to, uh, uh, to do what, what, what those uh, uh, guys in Romania with corruption and is this whole liberal pattern of building real capitalism or whatever. Um, uh, but we're combining the actual uh, uh, wishes of the population that are not being, like the actual demands that are not being represented within the mainstream official establishment politics. Okay, so those were social demands, those were demands that, that related to healthcare, to, to education, to jobs, and, and generally to, uh, uh, to, to, the, to the lack of future that youth feels throughout not just Serbia, but the whole, the whole of the Balkans. So that on the one hand, so what we call the set of like economic demands, and then on the other hand, like the set of political demands, uh, like roughly divided into uh, uh, into two, which which kind of dealt with with with, with this uh, 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 obvious question of of lack of democracy or de destroying even this bourgeois democratic uh, uh, limited uh, democratic uh, 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 framework where you can you know, win elections without actually having any sort of social base or having an absolute majority within the, 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 the state parliament without actually having any, any sort of social base, which is, uh, which is a, a pretty pe peculiar uh, 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 the thing of, of, of this uh, cynical politics of, of today. Um, so this intervention went quite well. Uh, we got we basically got in touch with, the media got in touch with us. So we were uh, starting, while coordinating with other self-organized groups who were not necessarily of the left, well, or rather liberal leaning, uh, but also not uh, being tied with any, uh, with any uh, political party uh, either. Uh, we were kind of working together on formulations, on media statements, on, on, on trying to shape the protests because some of the protests were later organized in support of teachers, some were organized uh, around, around a, a specific mobilization after, uh, after a worker of, of a factory who, who uh, had, hadn't re received his wage for 15 mo uh, months killed himself uh, within the factory walls. Uh, so there was, there was also one of the protests, and those were, yeah, I, I, I forgot to mention, those were protests being held every day. Okay, so one of those protests was, uh, was in solidarity with, with him and his uh, uh, family and workmates, uh, uh, et cetera. So uh, this, was, uh, this, this, this kind of intervention gave us hope that, that like after, years and years of being constantly on the defensive of trying to you know hide away or shy away from the fact that we come from the left because it's kind of not that popular and then you need to explain that you have nothing to do with Milosevic that if you were you know older than like 15 years old or something back in the day you would also fight against him that you, you you're not really for Tito is bullshit definitely not for some Stalinist uh, dictatorship, etc. So uh, it kind of gave us gave us uh, uh, hope because uh, uh, what what we kind of realized is that basically the new generation of people, the generations born during the 90s and and later, who are now being politicized, and which, which we we have been witnessing, especially uh, in case of UK and before that in in the US during the the, the election campaign who are massively being uh, politicized and pushed on the uh, forefront of, of, progressive, uh, of uh, progressive movements, uh, they do not have recollections of, you know, uh, failed so-called left-wing attempts at governing. Uh, they only have uh, a, a knowledge and experience of a cynical, hypocritical ruling class uh, with representatives generally from the right wing uh, 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 part of the political spectrum who among other bullshit that they uh, say and do also claim that the left is bad. Okay. Um, 
So the question arose, what is to be done next, since the protests are not, like we all realize that they, they can't last forever, and we're not going to simply, uh, you know, transform this, uh, this attempted hegemony on, of, the, of the ideas, of, of the perspective, into a, a structure, an organization that can actually, you know, do something, because it was obvious that the demand will not be, we want new elections because we have no one to vote for. Okay, which kind of leads us to, uh, uh, to last night. <laughs> uh, and I think we should all take a moment and appreciate what, what happened in, in, in the UK, uh, uh, because even though the, the context is pretty much different in many aspects, and, and that is obvious, there are quite, uh, quite a few uh, similarities uh, with our situation and, the, and it's the global aspect of, of the effects of the, uh, of the several decades of defeats uh, of the left and of the, the labor movement. Uh, and I think it's, it's been brilliantly shown by, by the Jeremy Corbyn leadership of, of the Labor Party that you can not easily, but you can, you can win against the stream, you can go against the stream, not adopt from the, the defensive positions, because like seven, seven weeks ago when the campaign started, he already had like two coup, coup attempts within, uh, within the party uh, from the establishment that said, no, no, you need to be more moderate politically, you cannot, you know, we know you're a Marxist or whatever you are, you're now in the leadership position, you need to be uh, made, you know, into this uh, classical state person that, that is being expect, expected by the electorate, but, but the electorate that they help, m helped mold throughout the previous decades is not the same. The electorate is now people who only have experience of political betrayal. I think this, 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 this experience is pretty important for all of us as well in our own context. Uh, because it kind of opens up the way uh, 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 of, of making politics, class-based politics, uh, politics again. Uh, and I think this is important because... Hey, Barka. Okay, we are uh, out of time. That's what oh, okay, okay. I'll, 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 I'm, I'm finishing up. I'm, I'm finishing up. Um, okay. Uh, I think that that is important because we all come from the movements. Those movements have always been, you know, built from below. Uh, we're all like from the grassroots initiatives, but we're all also been working in uh, trying to defend uh, the rights that previous generations struggled for. Uh, and we all realize that we cannot, you know, remain uh, in this situation forever. We cannot be defending everything because sometimes, yes. Yes, we need we need to be pushing forwards our own uh, our own struggles, and it's it's hard to do from 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 a defensive position, and, and like the, the, the previous decades have put us in this in this yes. position. Okay, but I think that that, that uh, uh, while trying to formulate political alternatives, which we which is something that we've been doing for quite some time within the Marx 21, but it's something that we uh, we've been doing doing much more collectively with other people on the left since. Uh, these, these protests uh, erupted, uh, needs to, uh, to take into account this uh, possibility of, of a radical shift in consciousness and in, 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 in general political, political situation, which is, uh, which is more international that, that we maybe might think uh, uh, in the beginning. And then uh, just for the end, we basically, we're, uh, uh, we're heading towards the, the, the Belgrade elections and uh, this this is what like I think everyone on the left here sees as sort of an opportunity to try and 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 test this idea and I think that, that this this it would be critical to learn from the experiences of of the Jeremy Corbyn led Labour Party uh, while formulating this type of alternative. Thank you.